Hello and welcome to the Lowy Institute Live. My name is Richard McGregor here in my capacity as the Institute's Senior Fellow for East Asia. This event, examining the issue of China and the foreign media, is the latest in what we would call what we call the Long Distance Lowy Institute. With COVID-19, our public events are now streamed live rather than being held at our headquarters. And we're grateful to see that so many people have signed to watch and listen today. First of all, some quick housekeeping. On the base of your screens, you'll see a Q&A button, which is where you can submit questions to the panelists. We'll be reviewing and moderating those questions and we'll ask some of them towards the end of the event. Uh, we've also received questions submitted during the registration process. So please your name and affiliation with the questions and keep them short. So to the topic. China and the foreign press have always had an uneasy relationship. But like China's relations with the US, they've gone downhill rapidly of late. China has recently effectively expelled about 20 foreign journalists, mainly Americans, but also two Australians, working for the three major US national newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. A number of journalists from the Wall Street Journal were expelled in February, officially in response to an opinion article which the Chinese government said was racist and for which they demanded an apology. About a month later in March, at midnight on March 16, the foreign ministry in Beijing announced that American journalists with all three newspapers uh, would also be expelled. Ostensibly, this was in response to decisions by the US government to cut the numbers of Chinese journalists working for the state media in the US. Now, even after 1989 and the crackdown on uh, protesters in Beijing and other cities in China, this is quite unprecedented. Now, to explore these issues behind the dispute, we have three senior journalists who have been based uh, in Beijing or are based there now. I'm gonna keep their CV short. You can find them all on the Lowy website. First, we have Joss Chin, who's the Deputy Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal, who's joining us tonight from Tokyo. Anna Fifield, the Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, who is joining us from Havelock North in New Zealand. And Jane Perlez, the former Beijing Bureau Chief for the New York Times, who is in Sydney. Thanks to you all. Josh, to start with you. You're in Tokyo because you had to leave the country. Effectively, you, you were kicked out. Could you tell us what happened there? What was behind the Chinese government's decision? I have to say, I've, I've been working in, in Beijing as a reporter for about 15 years, um, and I never really thought I'd see anything like this. And, and, and two months into life as an ex and I, I think if I'm being honest, I'm probably still a little bit in denial. Um, you know, at the time, the government had sort of been, had been ratcheting up pressure on news organizations. Um, you know, they, in, in a few cases, they had refused to renew visas for reporters they didn't like, including for one of my, my, my colleagues. Um, so we had a sense that, that things were going in a bad direction uh, in terms of the relationship between, between the Communist Party and foreign media. Um, but, you know, they hadn't, they hadn't actively expelled a reporter since, since 1998. And for them to kick out three of us from the same news organization at the same time was, was as you said, totally unprecedented, complete shock. Um, I can't go into to a, a ton of detail for, for a variety of reasons, but what, but I, what I can say was it was pretty clear from, from the way they delivered this message to us that the decision came from, from a pretty high level, um, from higher than, the, than the, the foreign ministry and from people who basically seem to have kind of given up on engagement um, in, in, in the same way that, that, that people in the U.S. government have. Um, and the reason I say that is, I mean, they, when they called... You know, so they called um, my bureau chief in at the time. His his visa was up, and we sort of felt like he that they might actually refuse to renew his visa. That was sort of our worst case scenario. Um, I was actually at the foreign ministry uh, when the meeting was happening, but was happening, but they didn't let me in. Um, and and instead, they they announced the expulsions of me, my um, my colleague Phil Wen, uh, an Australian. And then Chow Dung, another journal reporter who was in Wuhan at the time. And, you know, the way they delivered it, it was like they were reading an imperial edict, right? There was, there was sort of no discussion um, at all. They, they read it off. They read a, a statement and they said, that's that. 
uh, and half an hour later, they announced it at the foreign ministry um, press briefing, which kind of made it, you know, we sort of had vague hopes of reversing it, but once they made it public, that was, that was it. Um, and the, the official reason for doing so was an opinion article in the Wall Street Journal headlined, The Sick Man of Asia, uh, right. which the government or the foreign ministry took great offense at. Do you think that was the real reason? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't doubt that there were people in the in the Communist Party who were quite angered by that headline, which I, I should note that, you know, the Wall Street Journal has a, a, you know, like most newspapers has a really, really strict separation between between its news side and its opinion side. So no one, none of the reporters uh, in the Bureau in Beijing had anything to do with that opinion article, which is something that the, the foreign ministry knows very well. We made that point to them countless times and, and they've always known that they've complained about Wall Street Journal opinion headlines for years. Um, so this is not something new to them. Uh, so, you know, I think that maybe there were people uh, within the party who were upset at that headline and, and, you know, there's an argument for them to be justifiably upset at that headline. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the response, um, you know, kicking out, expelling three reporters seemed fairly disproportional to me, which suggests to me that there was, there were other, other uh, factors at play. Right. Now, I, I should have mentioned at the start, in fact, I did, but I, I, we had uh, technical problems. If you would like to submit a question, there's a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. You can submit a question there. We'll be reviewing and moderating them later. Uh, please state your name and affiliation and please keep the questions short. Now to Anna. Anna, what do you think is behind this the unprecedented number of expulsions. Why is China doing this? Is it simply because they're upset with coverage or because they think they can get away with it now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of both in a way and that they are feeling much stronger or more powerful and in many ways uh, that they don't need us anymore. That, you know, they have the wolf warriors on Twitter and they're able to go out there straight to the audience in some ways. Um, but I think the environment has really changed a lot. And so then we, when we look at what's happened during Xi Jinping's uh, tenure and how Chinese journalists now are required to pledge allegiance to the party, you know, to say their job is to pursue the Communist Party's goals there and they have to be on message for this. So I think that what the authorities are doing is trying to control the narrative and, you know, the, the pesky thing about foreign reporters uh, is that we don't stick to the uh, playbook in so many cases. We are independent, we go out and we do our own reporting and we tell the truth as we uncover it. So, I mean, you can see what has happened to independent journalists in China or um, semi-independent journalist outlets like Tsai Shin uh, has been doing amazing work on the coronavirus, but a whole bunch of citizen journalists and other independent people have been uh, arrested and disappeared during this coronavirus outbreak because they weren't sticking with the narrative as the party wanted it told. So I really think this is about control, uh, trying to control the message to the outside world and maybe um, a little bit about paranoia in some ways. I think that uh, yeah, be it being maybe conf confident and paranoid at the same time, if that's possible. Mm, yes, well, that is the combination, I think. Um, Jane, let me go to you now. Of course, there is a stated reason for the vast bulk of these expulsions. In other words, it's a tit-for-tat game with Washington. Earlier this year, um, I think the US pressed certain Chinese state media uh, organs in Washington to register uh, as state entities. Um, they also cut the number of uh, Chinese journalists from state entities in the US itself. So um, China simply, Beijing simply says, well, this is a game. If you want to play this game, we can play this game as well. Um, and that led to the vast bulk of the expulsions in March. Um, is that your understanding of it? And also, was that a good idea for Washington to start getting involved in that? Well, I think this outcome is entirely predictable. Uh, the Trump administration in early March said that they were going to expel 60 Chinese journalists. There are 160 in Washington, and they were going to expel 60 from five state uh, media organizations. Um, this had long been on the cards with previous administrations. The Bush administration, the Obama administration, had looked at the Chinese journalists everybody knew that some of them were doing double duty 
filing stories, but also filing for the intelligence agencies. And earlier administrations were troubled by this, but didn't decided not to expel Chinese journalists because they knew what was going to happen, that there'd be retaliation. Uh, and the Trump administration had other options. They could have restricted visas. They could have maybe sent out far fewer journalists. Um, it wasn't necessary to expel 60 uh, journalists. And you know, some people think it's not such a bad idea to have journalists in the country if they are doing double duty, because if they're filing for the security services, maybe it's interesting to know what they're interested in. So, and I think there is a fair argument to say that if you want to take on China, you don't have to become like China and you don't have to limit the press in your own country, i.e. by expelling Chinese journalists. And in a funny kind of way, the Trump administration is expressing open, you know, free press, uh, open access, because ironically, Chinese journalists in Washington can go into the Oval Office and in the daily scrum with uh, President Trump, ask him questions. And they do, and they ask him good questions. So I think um, the Trump administration has harmed American journalists, journalism by its own foolhardiness. In fact, I think the New York Times headline, if I may say, sort of summed it up. It said that the US tried to teach China a lesson in the media, but it backfired. Did the Trump administration miscalculate in your view, Jane? Well, they wouldn't see it as miscalculating because they don't love the New York Times or the Washington, Wall, Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. So there's a part of them that's quite happy to see, to see us out of there. Josh, I'll come back to you now. Um, having been through this process, as you say, when the expulsion order for the first batch of Wall Street Journal uh, reporters, it was read out sort of robotically and there was no discussion. Uh, China obviously has changed under Xi Jinping. It's more powerful, more assertive, more confident of itself. Um, do you think there are still some advocates in the system uh, for foreign journalists? And I guess that's a question in a broader context, advocates in the system for maintaining engagement for the West, uh, not taking on the West. Um... Sure. I mean, I think that I think that those people still exist. I mean, you know, you had in the it was interesting. You know, in the Hu in the Hu Jintao administration, sort of pre she obviously you had those people had more of a voice, and you could sort of see it um, in the Hu years because you had these sort of this this constant. It was kind of like an accordion, right? It was just constantly sort of uh, control was tightening and loosening all the time, and, and and in some ways it was kind of you could see these battles playing out between between hardliners and, and people who are more liberal and, and you know, there's this constant calibration. So, and a lot of those people are, you know, still in the party. They still, you know, uh, have senior positions, but I think that, you know, the political environment has shifted so much under Xi that those people, they just don't have, they don't have much of a voice, frankly. I mean, you don't, you don't see it as much, um, you know, you know, every once in a while here and there in sort of economic policy, you can sort of see the evidence of, of of, of, of those voices, but, but that's really the only area, and certainly not in media. I mean, MOFA is a really, the foreign ministry is a really interesting example, right? And that they used to be uh, probably the most dovish um, agency in the government. I mean, you, as a reporter, you used to be able to call them up and, you know, if you were being harassed while reporting, I mean, it didn't happen all the time, but you could get occasionally a MOFA official to, to help you out with local police. Um, at the least, at the very least, they answered your phone calls and pretended to be sympathetic, and that is that is effectively over now. And do you see Josh the same trend in actually talking to people as uh, you know the government has tightened, uh, the rules have tightened under Xi Jinping. So is your ability to um, gain access to officials, to scholars, and the like. Has that all gotten worse as well? Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that's. Um, I mean, you, you can really see that there is a you know, a climate of fear around uh, people in academia, officials, anyone talking, talking to the foreign media, being seen as talking to the foreign media. Um, you know, I have a good, a good friend I've known for, for years who's, a, who's an internet scholar at a, uh, one of the top universities in China, who I used to 
call all the time just to get his thoughts on you know anything having to do with the Chinese internet. And he he basically at one point told me to stop calling because he couldn't. It was not good for him to to be talking to me anymore. Um, and you know even official even even scholars who are sort of seen as um, who are government advisors, uh, who, are, who are tight with the government and who used to sort of, who used to be used to be their role to sort of deliver the, the government's message to the foreign media. Um, even some of them have become more more reluctant. Uh, and then it's you know and then you get down to the sort of even the level of, of on the street talking to regular people. I think the the party has fairly successfully poisoned the minds of a lot of people in China against foreign media and sort of demonize foreign reporters as as agents of, of, of you know, Western imperialism and, and, what, and whatnot. So, and then that, you know, message has sort of seeped down and, and you do get pushback from people you, when you're trying to report. And if I, and if I could come back to you, um, as we all know, there's been some particular stories in recent years, really over the last decade, that have particularly angered the Chinese government. There were a series of stories, New York Times, Bloomberg and the like, about the personal wealth of some of the top members of the Politburo, Wen Jiabao, and of course, Xi Jinping's family uh, himself. Mm -hmm. There's also been extensive reporting on Xinjiang and the internment camps used uh, to house Uyghurs uh, in the name of anti-terrorism. Do you think this is, if there's any particular trigger amongst these, uh, in these stories that's hardened uh, Chinese attitudes to the foreign press? Yeah, well, obviously the stuff that concerns the leadership and money is extremely sensitive and anything that uh, touches on the top leader in particular is kind of the third rail there and they don't want independent reporting about that. So a lot of the uh, recent cases where journalists have been expelled have all been related to, yes, that very top level of leadership and money related stories. So yes, Wall Street Journal story and Bloomberg and New York Times before that uh, all related to that. I think uh, with the Xinjiang reporting, this is something where obviously the authorities had tried to obstruct journalists from doing their jobs and from covering this. And, and you know, it's thanks to the great reporting and uh, a shout out now for Chris Buckley in particular, that the reporting that they have done from the Xinjiang region had it contributed so much to the world's understanding of what was going on there and how completely, you know, at odds it was with the official version of events. So even like during that period, I think it was, it's completely normal to have Chinese government goons like stop you, physically stop you, lay down traffic, you know, fake traffic accidents, uh, all sorts of things to obstruct journalists there. And I mean, now in a way the story has passed um, because they have normalized the situation. If you go to Xinjiang now, you won't see any of this. But uh, I think that China learned from this. They didn't want journalists to be able to be out there running around uh, and telling their own story. And so, I mean, there's two sides to this, I think. And part of it obviously is the expulsions of journalists uh, who have been doing this kind of work. Um, but also the way that, and which is less visible, I think, from the outside, the way that the authorities are now using visas as a weapon against journalists. So you hear about the ones who have been kicked out, but what you don't hear about is all of the journalists on very short visas. So whereas before it was standard to have a 12-month 12 12 visa, now there are many journalists who are on six month, three month, even one month visas, which means basically as soon as you get your visa, you have to submit again. And those one month, those very short visas have pretty much entirely been related to Xinjiang reporting. And that is the government's way of trying to, um, to stop to th threaten people. They're weaponizing visas in a way to try to make people stop. But um, you know, in many cases, I think it backfires because journalists want to show that this uh, will not influence their coverage and they will go out and, and do more of it. So, um, yes, very quickly on uh, Xinjiang, what struck me, of course, people were tracked and harassed when they were there. I was surprised that people were even able to get there. Is that no longer the case? Is it not possible now to even go to Xinjiang to try to do these stories? Um, I mean, last year I went to Xinjiang and, you know, for me, it's possible to go there. I wasn't knowingly followed uh, during the day. 
Uh, but it depends. Some people still are harassed and things. I guess it depends which part. Like Hotan, I think, is particularly a hot spot where people do get surveilled much more intensively. But also, like, for me, when I've been there, I haven't tried to really do reporting there because I don't want to endanger the people I talk to. So it's more like going to look around and to get colour and things to pad out a story or to, like... Um, add texture to a story that's been reported outside of the country. So it's forcing us to yeah, kind of be inventive in that way. Okay, Jane, back to you now. We're talking about this in the context of the US-China relationship. Obviously, it's mainly American reporters who've been targeted. Is this a US-China story or is it a China and the world story? You know, there's excellent German, French reporters, uh, UK reporters and the like. Um, why is it mainly about America? Well, actually, I think it's both. It's, it's basically, obviously, about the American press, but it's a US and the, a China and the world story because China is showing its strength and its muscle and its determination to really uh, be number one. I mean, I look at this in the context of how China sees itself. And I think, uh, although this happened before or during the coronavirus, well, it happened during the coronavirus crisis, I think they've decided at the top, game on, the United States is in disarray. Trump is a mess. Uh, this is our opportunity to make gains, particularly in Asia, but also in Europe. So they don't really care, I think, uh, what the United States thinks about this. And I think they are aiming for bigger things. The, the expulsion of the American journalists is just one step of many in showing who's in charge. Yes, I mean, we're focusing on this issue as journalists today, but this, in your view, is really one part of a much bigger picture? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, Xi Jinping, um, you know, as you all know, as we all know, he made himself emperor for life uh, and he's got, he thinks he's got a long road to go and he may have thought maybe this time last year that he would be doing game on a couple of years from now. But I think there's been pretty clearly a decision that they've decided they've come out of this coronavirus pretty well. They're going to try and ignore all the complaints about hiding it, and they're going to just push on, and this is one aspect of their pushing on. Um, Josh, uh, back to you. Um, uh, in my last stint in China for the Financial Times from the year 2000, that was at a time when China had just joined the WTO. Uh, they were listing their banks uh, on foreign stock exchanges and many of their big energy and other companies and the like. They had a clear interest in communicating with the rest of the world, particularly foreign investors. So at that time, relatively speaking, we got terrific access. You worked for the Wall Street Journal, had to cover similar issues. Um, is it basically that the uh, Beijing thinks there's no value in having the foreign press? It's all downside for them. They don't need us. Um, is that a big driver uh, at the moment? Um, yeah, you know, also in, in the early 2000s, they had just gotten the uh, the the Olympics paid for, for, for right. Beijing in 2008. So it was a, those are, those are great times for, for China, the communist party. Um, yeah. I mean, I think if you look back at the, the history of, I mean, you look about when they, when China decided to let the foreign media into the country, it was in, it was in 1978, it was the beginning of reform and opening. And they, the entire reason for that was that they needed foreign investment and, and no, no one outside of China was going to invest large amounts of money in China if they didn't feel like they could get reliable information about what was happening there. Um, and I, th I really think that that, is, that has been the driving motivation for the party to, to, to countenance the foreign media the entire time, right? I mean, we know that they don't like what we do. They don't like, you know, the criticism, you know, Western ideas about what journalism, the function journalism serves that clash with the party's ideas. Um, pretty, pretty harshly. And, you know, I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal is a great example in the sense that we had um, for a long time, because we were perceived as a, as a primary, primarily financial newspaper, I think the FT had a, had a similar 
um, situation, you know, we, I think we got more leeway than say the Washington Post or the New York Times in terms of our political coverage. We didn't, we weren't um, punished. We didn't lose um, reporters through visa denials and, and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and I think that's because they saw us as speaking to the American business community. And, um, and that, is, that has changed uh, completely in the last couple of years. Uh, and to me, that that basically, you know, I, I mean, obviously, don't know. It's speculative. Uh, no one knows exactly what the decision process is. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's coincidental that this is happening at the same time as the U.S. and the Chinese economies are decoupling. Um, and I think, you know, if you're the Communist Party, it, the the costs of of um, of having foreign media in China maybe outweigh the benefits at this point. That's right, and they're focused on the Chinese market, not the U.S. market anymore. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, I think they do have, you know, the Chinese market is big enough and, you know, Chinese internet companies have, have, have blown up. They have, you know, they're some of the biggest tech companies in the world and they mostly serve the Chinese market. I mean, there are very few of them um, with the exception of, of, of Huawei. And I guess now, uh, um, you know, some of the, the video streaming platforms, you know, those are the only ones that have gotten outside of China. So they don't, you know, maybe their perception is they don't need as much the rest of the world. I mean, obviously that's that's a really simplistic view and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that actually isn't the case, but but that's, that does seem to be a factor in, in how they're going about things. And uh, um, obviously with uh, limited access, um, uh, journalists have to use other techniques to report. Uh, a lot of um, reporters have focused on a doc documents, for example, mm -hmm. uh, maybe filed with the SEC in New York or uh, the Hong Kong Securities Exchange. Uh, others are using, you know, the sorts of imagery that was used in uh, reporting on Xinjiang, satellite imagery and the like. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about that, about the sort of different techniques that uh, journalists would now use about to report on China, open access as it were, uh, in the absence of being able to talk to Chinese officials? Yeah, um, well, those are both great examples that you've used and how yeah, reporters have been able to use satellite pictures in particular to show the expansion of the camps or the existence of the camps in Xinjiang and what is happening there. Uh, the various tranches of documents that have come out over the past year about what has been happening in Xinjiang have shed so much light on what is happening, who has ordered it. Uh, as well, in particular, and how it went all the way to the top in some of those papers. So I think, I mean, it requires quite a lot of inventiveness in a way. And I think a lot of the reporting, the, not the best, but a lot of great reporting has been about China is now done outside of China. So it's journalists who go to Kazakhstan or Turkey uh, to talk to Uyghurs uh, and people about who are in touch with family members or who have escaped from China and from the, this camp environment to report about what is happening inside of China. So, you know, uh, in many ways, it fe it's increasingly feeling like reporting about North Korea, you know, even when you are living in China, because now it is so difficult to talk to, um, to talk to ordinary people and to find out what's going, you know, people are very afraid. Yes, I've had exactly the same experience as Josh and that professors and people who you know are um, very articulate and very savvy in the system and who would usually talk to you now they don't want to be associated with and they don't want to be in a story that may have negative content about China even if they are saying good thing like if they are uh, fighting China's corner in that story but also ordinary people now don't want to be associated with American media in particular they're just afraid of attracting attention so that kind of reporting has become increasingly difficult so yeah I mean in a way it's about uh, maybe I'm trying to bring my background or my lens of North Korea to bear on this I mean obviously China is not North Korea, right? Like we can go out, we can talk to people, but it's becoming harder and harder. And it does feel like it's much more of a jigsaw puzzle of having to put together all of these pieces. I mean, do you feel as though, you know, um, very briefly, less and less? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's that famous kind of curve of being a foreign correspondent or anything, moving to a country and thinking, you know, I know nothing, I know nothing like one year and thinking, wow, I've really cracked it. I know everything now and now I'm definitely plummeting back down and realizing, yeah. But yeah, it's really hard. I mean, and some of it is just very kind of it warps your mind. And like, even when I was out talking to people and suddenly turn like trendy hipster young people about the Hong Kong situation and things, and they would say things like, oh, you know, these spoiled brats in Hong Kong, they don't know how lucky they are. And they would be often trumpeting the party line. And it's this strange thing where it's like, are they saying this because they should tell me or are they saying it because it's what they know, and what they really think. And often we, you know, I think it's what they really think, but it takes some kind of percolating to figure it out. I think it's not trend obvious anymore. Um, Jane, to you now. Now, it's, it's a bunch of journalists talking together. Journalists can be as uh, self-serving as any other profession. Uh, naturally, we would say we're standing up for thing, you know, principles like free speech and the like. But if, if you look at it from the, uh, you know, and we would probably argue, once again, self-servingly, that this damages China. It's not in their interest because it's important for the world to know what's going on in China. But for the Communist Party's uh, point of view, um, is it against their interests uh, to kick out foreign journalists and play hardball for them? Um, or will it hurt them in the long run? Uh, before I answer that directly, I just want to add something to what Anna had to say about reporting in China now. I think we should also uh, own up to the fact that all of us for many years have had um, very, very, very talented Chinese researchers who uh, accompany us to most places. And speaking for the New York Times during the coronavirus situation, did really brilliant reporting through WeChat uh, and other means. Uh, for example, one of our Chinese researchers talked directly to Dr. Li, the famous doctor who exposed uh, the virus and then was silenced by the government and then finally died. I mean, she talked to him on his deathbed, basically, through WeChat. And we were able to get just amazing human stories through this way. And we're still able to do so, even though uh, the Chinese government has forced two of our researchers to, to resign. And I think they did the same at the Wall Street Journal. You can, you can correct me if that's wrong, and maybe at some other places as well. So, you know, all is not lost on the reporting front. There's nothing like being on the street, as Anna described. And when I was there, last year in the in the last year or two of my assignment i would sometimes wake up in the morning and think oh my god this must have been what it was like to be in the reporting in the soviet union except outside our doors was the sort of the glossiest most consumer oriented society that the world has ever seen um so it, it is uh you know so to get to your question about does this hurt the communist party uh, look they don't think so otherwise they wouldn't have done it and as uh, I think Josh said in his opening remarks, this seems to have been, it's pretty clearly the expulsion of the journalists was approved by the tippy top. Uh, it was maybe initiated and suggested by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Security Services, we don't know, but something as dramatic as this, uh, 20 Western journalists gone in a couple of months was approved by the top. And they obviously think that they have their own methods, the wolf warriors, as Anna mentioned, uh, to, do, to do their propaganda work and to do their storytelling. And, and maybe that will work for them. It's, it's hard for me to tell. I mean, I'm not going to put my Western uh, freedom of the press views onto the Chinese Communist Party. They don't believe in it. So let's see how they fare with it. Yes, we'll see about that. Um, Josh, to you now, you're writing a book, well into writing a book, if I'll uh, boil it down on the, the surveillance state in China, if that's accurate. How uh, easy, how possible, in fact, is it for a foreign journalist in China to actually go about their business without the sto state knowing absolutely everything that you're doing? Um, well, you know, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And I think, um, you know, what I've what I've discovered in the, in the course of writing this book is, you know, I mean, you start out and you see all of the, the sort of amazing, almost magical 
um, surveillance technology the Communist Party has at its disposal. I mean, they have some of the some of the best AI researchers in the world working on on this problem, uh, and some of the best companies. And you, you sort of automatically when you go you go to a place like Xinjiang, as Anna mentioned, and and the surveillance is everywhere, and you sort of assume that they they know everything. Um, and I think they want you to assume that they know everything. Um, and I and you know what the reality of, you know is actually is. I think nobody knows. Um, but I think they've done a really effective job of making everyone think about it constantly. And so whether or not they're actually tracking you um, everywhere you go, you kind of have to assume they are. And that, that's partly because you have a responsibility to sources in China, right? You don't want to expose them or put them in danger. Um, and so you, you have to act as if they are watching you all the time, even if they're not. But I guess um, you assume if they want to know, they can know. I think, yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. Um, I mean, uh, you know, if you, if any sort of cybersecurity expert you talk to, you know, I mean, a, a, a government as powerful as, as China's, if they want to know something about you, they can, they can know it. It just depends on how badly they want to. Anna, to you now to um, uh, uh, come back to one of the points Jane made. Um, absolutely right. There's been heroic and fantastic uh, uh, and brave uh, Chinese working for foreign media, working with foreign journalists as their assistants. But what about Chinese journalists themselves? I mean, are the best journalists in China are obviously Chinese journalists who work under extremely difficult conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned earlier, they do uh, Tsai Xing magazine and Tsai Jing and the like. Uh, a lot of them do terrific work until they're not allowed to. Um, the same trends that we see in the foreign media, um, you know, less access, less information, less liberty to report on issues. Is that also basically tracked in the Chinese media, both state and semi-private? Yeah, I mean, as far as I can tell and as far as I can see, yes, uh, that does seem to be the, the case. And even just looking at the kinds of questions and things that the Chinese state media journalists ask at uh, press conferences, it seems, you know, that they are very much remembering their pledge um, to serve the party in much of this. Like, it's very uniform, the coverage uh, that comes from Chinese state media, which I think is why it's so incredibly valuable to have the kind of work, yes, that Tsai Shen, I mean, Tsai Shen has just been knocking it out of the park during this coronavirus outbreak, really powerful, great reporting. And, um, you know, one of the questions is how have they been allowed to do this? I mean, it's fantastic that they have, but there's always this kind of sense of foreboding of how long it will go on. So, I mean, one thing that I am really, really conscious of, and to pick up on what Jane said there, that you know, for us, it's one thing to be a journalist in China and to be going out and, you know, we run the risk of getting kicked out, like Josh has unfortunately discovered. But I'm really conscious of the risks that the Chinese journalists, uh, either the ones who work for foreign media or the independent journalists, like, um, yeah, those doing their own reporting or for places like Tsai Xin, Tsai Jin, the stakes are so much higher for them. Uh, you know, they they are Chinese. They live in China. They have family members in China, and the state has become increasingly willing to take advantage of that and use those um, family links and things as levers. So it's an incredibly stressful environment for them in China. And so, yeah, I will just um, say as well that I am in awe of them and the service that they do for our readers in the outside world as a result. And of course, if you want to uh, join a well-paid profession in China, you won't be becoming a journalist because they're neither well-paid nor given great status as well. Do any of us anywhere become a journalist to be well-paid? <laughs> I think I'm in the wrong place. But yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, and one of the great um, kind of... Uh, my great regrets about this Chinese system is that the way that it's structured is that we cannot give proper credit as well to the Chinese journalists who work with us in the stories. They are not allowed to have bylines on stories. You know, there's no kind of career path ahead for them. Um, so they're really just doing it for the love of the, the truth and the, I guess, freedom of media and uh, expression there. So, yeah, I really salute them for that. Okay, so we're going to go to audience questions now, and I'll direct this first one to uh, Jane. Uh, and in the spirit of openness, it's from the CCTV, China Central Television correspondent in Sydney, Australia, Wang Tong. Uh, I don't agree with the precepts of this question, but I'll, I'll, I'll convey it faithfully. 
Um, and he's wondering to what extent China has changed your impression since you spent time there. Uh, as a journalist in a Western culture, do you think overwhelmingly negative reports changed your readers and viewers, viewers made them more biased against China and even fostered racism in Australia and elsewhere? Um, Jane, if you're able to take that on, in other words, did you, were you biased, do you think? Um, and did you sort of damage uh, community relations or do foreign journalists do that? I wish we had the power to influence our readers so much, not in the way that the, that the questioner is asking, but uh, I think he overstates our power. Our power. Look, I don't think uh, any journalists go to China with a, an anti-China bias, nor do we have any intention of writing anti-China stories. Most Western journalists I know who want to go to China and who do, who do go to China uh, are intensely curious about the chi about China from all aspects, uh, political, cultural, economic, right across the board. And I, 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 just, I just refute the idea that uh, New York Times coverage, Wall Street Journal coverage, or Washington Post coverage has uh, fostered racism or anti-China feelings. Um, I, I, Maybe the Trump administration tries to do that. Maybe other governments try to do that, but we in the press do not. And I just uh, like to add to this questioner that many New York Times journalists, for example, who even bef before they became journalists there had been to China, either to study the language or had spent years there in, acad in at universities and had a long attachment to the country. And I just think it's unfair to say that we uh, have fostered um, racism or anti-China attitudes. I, I, I can't agree with that. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> There's another question from Valerie Sands, and this is about the PRC trying to control the media message. Um, uh, how likely is it that an independent review of the origin of COVID-19 will be allowed and what implications might this have? Josh, why don't you have a go at that? Um, <laughs> I think it's extremely unlikely that an independent review of, of this is, is going to happen. I just, I mean, I don't really see what's, what's in it for the party. Um, I mean, I think it's clear from the reporting at the time that, that you know, that the journal did and the Post and the Times have done, um, that there was, there were mistakes um, in the way that this was handled. Um, and early on, I mean, even the, even Chinese media had reported on it, especially extensively uh, in, 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 in Sai Xin, for example. Um, so I think it's clear that, that there are issues with the way the Communist Party handled this initially that they don't want revisited. And any sort of independent um, investigation of, of the origins of the of the pandemic would would inevitably uh, drag that back up. And I think um, I think Jane was right in the sense that the party feels like it has a it has a relatively it's come relatively it's come out of this pandemic with in, in a relatively good position, and they can sort of ignore the negative stuff. And and uh, so I don't see I just don't see that happening. Okay, um, Anna, we have a question from Michael Smith, <clears throat> who I suspect might be the AFR's correspondent in Shanghai. Uh, do you envisage a future scenario where China feels it no longer needs foreign correspondents at all, regardless of what country they represent? Um, yeah, it's not beyond the realms of possibility, given what we've seen over the course of this year already. I think that in many ways, China thinks that we're annoying and pesky because we do independent reporting and we don't, you know, stick to the narrative. So, yeah, I could see a situation where they think we've served our purpose. And in some ways, like you and Josh were talking about before, about how Wall Street Journal FT was very helpful when China was trying to attract foreign investment and appeal to an audience. And now China doesn't need to sell itself anymore. You know, it's this huge market. Uh, companies have put up with a lot and continue to put up with a lot in order to get access to that market. So I think... Now they think they are so big uh, that they don't have to worry about this kind of thing now that they can attract investment regardless, that they can uh, write their own narrative and send that out into the world um, without us. So yeah, I think they see all 
upside and no um, and no oh sorry all downside and no upside there at all. I mean, and just to add, especially to what Jane had said before about I mean I also uh, strongly object to the question about fermenting racism and things, but. One of the things that has surprised me a lot uh, since I've come to China is how, you know, everything is so obstructionist now that there, there are big roadblocks put up, uh, of course, like sometimes literally roadblocks, uh, when we want to do stories on Xinjiang and this kind of stuff. But there's a lot of uh, stories that could be good, uh, you know, the kind of things that China would want to be having sent out to the outside world that they also block um, us from writing. So one thing that really sticks in my mind is last summer, uh, they opened this Mars simulation base in the desert in Gansu and lots of Chinese kids were going on summer camp there and dreaming about going to Mars. And I thought, what a wonderful little story. I'd like to go and write about these kids. And they said no, for the same, the same reason. They said, no, it's you, American media, you can't come here. So this is the kind of thing, you know, China has made big advances in terms of space ex uh, and space race or space exploration. So why would they not want us to write about that? I don't know, but, uh, but they, they just obstruct us at every turn, I think. Jane, I want you to expand on some of the issues raised there. In other words, this issue of uh, China not needing the West in any form, Western journalists, whatever. Uh, do you think they're right or is that hubris? Well, it's hard to say in this interconnected globalized world that China uh, doesn't need uh, Western Western journalists. I think that's uh, I think that's absurd. They probably think that they can find uh, Western journalists more to their liking, which I think is also wrong. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine, though, that they will shut themselves off completely um, to Western journalists, to well, to the big newspaper organizations. Uh, on the other hand, maybe they think they can do it all by having American journalists, and there are plenty of them who go to work for CCTV, uh, China Daily, etc. I mean, in, in Washington, uh, CCTV, known there as CGTN, has formally announced that those journalists of theirs who are being sent back to China by the Trump administration will be replaced by American journalists who are happy to write Chinese, write the news for CGTN according to the, the likes of CGTN. I mean, I guess the journalism market in, this, in the United States is pretty bad and they think they can find journalists who will do it and they probably will be able to. Um, but if you know, China wants to be a world power, even in a world dominated by China, um, they can't limit themselves just to Chinese journalists. Um, but I do think they're going to give us, meaning Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, a very hard time for quite a while. I mean, some people think that if Trump gets, uh, loses and a new administration comes in in November, that we'll all be allowed back in. I think that's way over optimistic. First of all, a new democratic administration is going to have bigger things to deal with with China than a few journalists. If it's anything like the past, you know, the Democrats will come to Beijing and, and say to whoever's left of the Western media, oh, we're here to push your cause, we'll get you visas, we'll get you back in. But the fact of the matter is that the Western press is about 0.26 of 30 talking points that you know, any new administration or old administration needs to talk to Beijing with. So I think the majors are out for quite a while. And look, AP, Reuters, Bloomberg is still there. They can make do with those very well, thank you very much. Bloomberg does some great reporting. Reuters does some great reporting, AP too. Um, you know, they don't, they don't need the three of us. Um, how depressing. Um... Josh, to you, from Adam Kendall, do you believe that the social credit system is playing a part in the level of engagement you're able to have with your sources? Um, I don't, I think the, the social credit system is a very thorny issue. I mean, I think there's a lot of mythology and, and, and hype and confusion around what it is. Um, I mean, I think even amongst 
officials in China. Um, I, I think it's a really, um, it's hard to know exactly what's going on with it and how much how much bite it has. And as far as we can tell, um, you know, some people are ending up on blacklists as a result of it, and, and but mostly that has to do with legal cases. It's just a, it's just a sort of another form of administrative punishment, you know, uh, for people who owe money to other people or, or whatnot. Um, and, um, so I don't think I don't think that that in and of itself is is playing a role. But I do think that this this notion of the of the party as having much more visibility into individuals' lives um, and, and ability to track what they're doing and, and keep records and and, um, and analyze those records. I think that is, you know, for a Chinese, you know, a Chinese person who is reasonably tech and tech savvy and politically savvy, who might be talking to a foreign journalist, I think they're all well aware of, of, of that in, increasing visibility that the party has. And, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that that has an effect on what they're willing to say. Um, Anna, on the, in relation to that depressing career path painted out by um, Jane about returning to the US, for example, and joining Chinese state media, uh, this question from Julian Robertson, how successful is China in using state-sponsored media and foreign-placed journalists to shape perspectives in the US and other nations? As we know, they've spent a lot of money on this. Um, is it working? Yeah. Um... I don't know if it's working in places like America. I mean, certainly the China Daily, you know, um, supplement is available in many newspapers. Unfortunately, it has been in mine too, um, but also available in hotels. The actual printed newspaper, I think it's called China Watch around Capitol Hill. I'm not sure how many people pick that up. Um, I think what has been much more successful is their outreach to places uh, to audiences that we don't see. So in particular, I think about Middle Eastern journalists who have been invited, or journalists from Muslim um, majority countries who have been invited on these press tours to, uh, to Xinjiang and to taken into these schools where people are literally singing, if, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands to them. Uh, and that that kind of stuff can be much more effective for them. Uh, and if these journalists then go home and write it in their newspapers and say it on their TV to audiences uh, that China is probably think is uh, much more, more easily swayed or that they are um, a tabula rasa for them to lay their narrative onto. I think they look at these kinds of places as much easier to influence than say, yeah, the US or um, UK or, or places that they might also be trying. It doesn't mean they're not trying, but I think that they know that there are some limitations there. That's an excellent point. I think during the COVID-19 crisis, there a clip uh, a cop, a propped up a, a, a young Chinese woman speaking in Arabic. Uh, and spreading the same conspiracy theory about the United States um, bringing the virus to China. Now, in my chat box, uh, the question I wanted to ask next has disappeared. I'll ask it from memory. Um, <clears throat> Alexandra Wake from uh, RMIT in Melbourne. Uh, she says that Australian universities train a lot of uh, journalists in China and run journalism courses. Does that fact, I think she means the fact that Australian universities do that, uh, signal uh, approval for the way that the Chinese government <clears throat> is treating foreign journalists. Jane, I'll put that question to you. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what the point does is. The, does the fact that Australian universities uh, train, um, does do journalism training in China and research projects with Chinese journalism scholars, uh, Alexandra Wake says, I'm concerned that this sends a signal of our approval of the Chinese government's actions against journalists. Oh, I, I think it's the opposite. I think uh, <coughs> presumably Australian journalism uh, is being, I mean, Australian universities are teaching journalism in China in, with the idea of giving training in objective reporting, how to go about it, um, to try and demonstrate you know, a couple of centuries of uh, objective reporting techniques by by Western newspapers and Western media organizations. I don't think that uh, the logic of that doesn't quite follow. So it's a good thing, in other words, to stay yes. engaged on that level. Definitely, it should be more, there should be more of it, not less. Um, <clears throat> now, I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I'll ask Joss this question. Anybody else can comment on it as well. 
many people have said the fact that uh, China has basically expelled a lot of the most China literate journalists uh, in the world, and they're now really free to go out to the rest of the world and report on China, what China is doing around the world. Josh, is that going to be a fertile new area of reporting, and is that going to be damaging for China? Um, I don't know how damaging it's going to be to China. I, mean, I, I definitely, I hope it's going to be fertile because that's the uh, that's the area that that I'm sort of by uh, that I'm going to be forced to to concentrate on more. I mean, I do. I'm actually really excited about it. I think it's an area that um, that we haven't that the foreign media hasn't covered as 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 completely as maybe it deserves. Um, and I think there are a, a, lot, a lot of great stories about the way China is changing how the world works. And, and in some ways, I think the reporting will be, I expect it will be easier um, because China can't control all those environments uh, the way it does uh, control the, the party can control those environments the way it controls uh, the environment in China. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite excited about it actually. Anna, and then Jane, do you have any comment on that uh, a new sort of genre of China reporting? The uh, possibilities for China reporting in Africa, for example, are absolutely astounding. I think it would be just great to know how Belt and Road is really going down in Africa, how Belt and Road is going down in many of the Southeast Asian countries. We've seen some reporting, but uh, I think that would be really interesting. I think, for example, to see how the tech companies are doing in Indonesia, they they are doing fantastically, but we haven't seen any real reporting about it. That's for you, Josh. Uh, I think reporting about China in the Antarctica and the Arctic all around the world. And I think also what China is doing in Europe, um, splitting Europe uh, into, into two, two blocks. Um, they're pursuing that very hard. And I think that's really important for how the world's going to shake out in the next couple of years, uh, really fertile territory. Anna, you have the last word. Oh, my thank you. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. There is lots of fertile ground for reporting on the outside, but I don't think that that should, you know, in an ideal world, that should not be the entirety of our reporting about China. We, you know, China is home to 1.4 billion people. And as a foreign correspondent, you know, I want to be there on the ground and talking to people and trying to, you know, the whole thing about being a foreign correspondent is to try to get under the skin of a country and to understand and you know, to be the eyes and ears for your readers in many way and that. So I want to report on how Chinese people think about their prospects within their country, their hopes and dreams, uh, you know, all of the reasons why we are foreign correspondents in the first place. So I, I hope, maybe I'm ending on a naive or optimistic note, but I hope that we would be able to get back and to do a lot more of that because, I mean, I can see there's a lot of hunger from the outside world, from readers and viewers as well, to get some of that granular detail of what life is like in, in China in the 21st century. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think it's actually important for even hardened foreign correspondents to retain a touch of naivety. It helps. Mm -hmm. um, look, on that note, Josh, Anna and Jane, I really appreciate you giving your time. I'm sorry we didn't get all the questions. We've had lots. Um, but I uh, appreciate so many people signing in as well. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again on our next, or one of our coming Long Lowy Institute Long Distance Live events. Thank you very much. <laughs>